the book of John, chapter 14, verse 16. It's the same one we had for last week. John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. You know, for the, for the first four Sundays of this year, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and how we can recognize and respond to the Spirit actually which dwells in us. Uh, as I said at the beginning, without a proper response to the Holy Spirit, our lives would be unproductive and our service would be feeble. Now, uh, as our Lord approached the end of his ministry, his disciples were horrified at the thought of their loneliness and helplessness if he should be taken from them. You know, to feel separated by distance or death from someone who's very precious is one of life's most painful experiences. I have a friend uh, and know of others who have experienced death this week. To feel separated by distance or by death from someone who's very precious is one of life's most painful experiences. You know, it's even possible to experience painful loneliness in the midst of a crowd. Now, the disciples were no different than anyone else when it came to their fear of death. Now, even though they had been with Jesus and had seen his power over death, he had actually raised some people from the dead, Lazarus, if they, they had witnessed that, the fear of death was always with them, um, especially when Jesus spoke about his own death. Every time that Jesus told his disciples he was going to die, they were uneasy, and sometimes they even tried to persuade him to give up his destiny of death. Remember what Peter said? It's in Matthew uh, chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. Here's what Peter said. From the time that Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are suddenly brought to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So they tried to talk Jesus out of going to his death. Imagine, wait a minute, how you would have felt if you were one of his disciples hearing that Jesus was about to die and that you would not be able to come to him or to be with him. Well, just imagine that. Well, Jesus wanted to encourage them and to equip them for future ministry by his teachings and by his promise of another comforter, another counselor, another helper. Now, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, in contrast to Jesus' brief ministry of three short years, would come as a continuing presence never to depart. Now, this comforter would not only be with them, but he would be in them. If we look at John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Now, Jesus, who was the visible manifestation of the invisible God when he was on this earth as a human being, was limited. During his, three, during his 33 years, but the three years of his ministry, he was limited because he could be in only one place at one time. That's why Jesus said, if you look at verse 7 of John 16, that's why Jesus said, 
But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now, as I said last week, the Revised Standard Version of this verse uh, translates the statement this way. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go not away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. But Jesus told them, he told his disciples, that the Father would give them another counselor exactly the same as he was. But he would be different in that he would be with them forever because he would be in them. For example, now, you know, if, if Jesus had to go uh, when he was on this earth, if he had to go from point A to point B, he walked there just like anyone else. Jesus got tired just like we do. Jesus got sleepy just like we do. And Jesus got hungry just like we do. Now, Jesus could have done whatever he wanted, Yet he put himself under the restraints of human frailty for us. The Bible tells us that God sent his own son in a body like the bodies we have. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 3. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for us. Jesus, when he was a human being, could only be in one place at one time. He told his disciples that he was leaving them, and so he was now giving them assurance that he would still be with them because he was going to ask the Father to send another comfort. Now, from our perspective, those of us who live on this side of Calvary, on this side of the resurrection, and on this side of the day of Pentecost, we can understand better what they at that time could not understand. They didn't know what he was talking about. They didn't understand until something very remarkable happened. You look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, Verses 1 through 4. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be the tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And later that same day, Peter, when he was speaking to the crowd, said this, and if this is, is Acts, it's, it's Acts 2 also, verses 14 through 21. This is what Peter said about this experience. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So after that, then the disciples understood what Jesus was saying when he was trying to describe to them. I'm leaving, but I'm going to send someone to you because I'm living, that will comfort you, guide you, and direct you. Now, the Holy Spirit is God's gift to every believer. 
to every believer. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not dwell in people. The Holy Spirit did not indwell people as it does this side of Pentecost, after Pentecost. Before Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and return to heaven, the Holy Spirit would come on chosen people for a limited period of time to equip them and empower them for some specific, unique task. For example, we look at Exodus chapter 31, verses 2 through 6. This is when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God giving instructions as to how to build the tabernacle, how it could be, was to be constructed, and all the furnishings that were going to be in it. So if we look at Exodus 31, 2 through 6. I have chosen Bezalel, son of Ori, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom, with understanding and knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Oholiab, son of Ahithamek, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given ability to, to all the steel workers to make everything as commanded. So God gave his spirit to these specific people for a specific task. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit of the, in the Old Testament, of the coming upon men in the Old Testament, was selective and temporary. For example, uh, it came on... Uh, uh, if you go to the Numbers, Numbers chapter 27, verse 18. Where it came on people in the Old Testament, like Joshua, that's in Numbers 27, 18. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom the spirit is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Or it came upon David. The Spirit of the Lord, the Holy, the Holy Spirit, came upon David. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, 16, chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. So it sent for him and brought him in. He was glowing with, health, glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord says, said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And on that day, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Now remember the term, it says the Spirit came upon David, right? He gave the Holy Spirit that even came upon Saul, the first king of Israel. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10. When he, is, he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came proudly upon him, and he joined in their prophecy. If you read the book of Judges throughout that book, we see the Spirit coming upon the various judges who God raised up to deliver Israel from their oppressors. The Holy Spirit came upon these people for a specific task. <clears throat> the coming of the Holy Spirit is a sign of God's favor, favor upon the individual. And for example, David. And if God's favor left, the Holy Spirit coming upon someone that was a sign of God's favor. And if God's favor left the individual, the spirit would depart. As in Saul's case, the same king who, who prophesied in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. In the, whole, in the Old Testament, the spirit coming upon an individual Notice in the case of Saul, and if you read Judges, in the case of many of those judges, uh, 
the Holy Spirit coming upon this individual didn't always indicate that person's spiritual condition. Saul's an example, and many of the judges are an example, uh, and Samson in particular. But remember what I said, the spirit in the Old Testament before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection came on specific individuals for a specific task. After Jesus' resurrection, the spirit that dwells in believers is permanent. It's indwelling and it's permanent. There's a, there's a marked difference in the way the Holy Spirit came on upon individuals before Pentecost and the manner in which he comes to indwell each believer after Pentecost. If you want to take a look at the book of John, chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Then anyone who's thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scriptures have said, rivers of living water, and that's a representation of the Holy Spirit, rivers of living water will flow from within, from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up until that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. The Holy Spirit came upon, not in. And in John 14, 16 to 17, which we read before, and I'm going to read again, and I will ask the Father that he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Remember, the gift of the Holy Spirit comes by God's grace. We don't earn the privilege of having the Holy Spirit to abide within us. The gift of the Holy Spirit comes through faith. It's by faith we receive Christ, and it is by faith that we receive, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by faith, just as we receive Christ. We look at Galatians 3, 1 through 5. Galatians 3, 1 through 5. You foolish Galatians, who has been with you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed and crucified. I would like you to learn just, well, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced much, so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give his Spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So, it's by faith we receive Christ and the Holy Spirit. It's not a, it's, we earn that privilege by faith, through faith. Now the Holy Spirit is the constant, continuing presence of the resurrected Christ within each of us. Let me repeat that. The Holy Spirit is the constant, and continuing presence of the resurrected Christ within each of us. John 14, 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. And what he was talking about when he said this was not, he was not referring to his glorious return at the end of the age, he was referring to his return in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost after he ascended to heaven. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Acts 1, 4 and 5. Once when he was eating 
with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus, remember, you remember Jesus gave the Great Commission at the end of Matthew, uh, where he says, Therefore, go, it's Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Remember, the Holy Spirit is Jesus' constant and continuing presence in us. When we experience the presence of the living, triumphant Lord, we experience it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit who has come to actually abide, to live, to dwell in every believer. Galatians 2.2 2 says this, and Paul uh, wrote uh, in this letter to the Galatians, uh, to the church of Galatia, it's in chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ is in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Paul experienced the presence of the living Christ through the abiding spirit who had come to dwell with him and to dwell within every believer. The Holy Spirit abides with us, dwells with us to teach us God's truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who comes to teach us all the things that God wants us to understand. John 14, 25, and 26. John 14, 25, and 26. All this has spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So one of the Holy Spirit's mission is to guide us into all the truth of God. All the truth of God. John 16, 12 through 15. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when... The spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, Jesus, because it is from me that he will receive. Uh, it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known. He the truth. The Holy Spirit guides us into God's truth. Chapter 4 of John, verses 23 and 24 say this. John 4, 23 and 24. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And the Holy Spirit guides us and gives us God's truth. The Holy Spirit uses the scriptures to teach us God's truth. The Holy Spirit uses the church to help us understand the truth. The Holy Spirit uses other believers to lead us into the truth. As I said last week, the Holy Spirit also creates conflict, creates conflict between our old natures 
and the spirit that is now within us. Galatians 5, 15 and 16, 16 and 17. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. So I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. The Holy Spirit fills us with holy discontent until we let the living Christ reign supreme in our hearts. The Holy Spirit comes to fill us and to give us victory over evil. The Holy Spirit comes to give us victory over sin and evil. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So put on, be strong in the Lord, and put on the full armor of God provided by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20 say this. Ephesians 5, 18 through, 18 through 20. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit comes to fill us with victory. We have victory, and the Holy Spirit confirms that in our lives. The Holy Spirit produces within us. The Holy Spirit produces within us the fruit of the Spirit. And we know what that is. It's in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The Holy Spirit produces this within us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit as the, and I said it earlier, the abiding, constant, continuous presence of Jesus Christ. So we should all recognize and rejoice in this gift of the Holy Spirit. We should also respond to the to words, the gentle impulses, and loving leadings of the Holy Spirit. We should trust the Holy Spirit to guide us and also enable us, give us the power to do what God wants us to do. Now, though we don't or didn't experience that same phenomenal scene as the disciples did or the apostles did on the Pente day of Pentecost, we do receive that same power. We receive that same power of the Holy Spirit when we confess Christ as our Savior. The power in us is greater than anything that the world can throw at us. Now, it doesn't make us invincible, and it doesn't shelter us from the storms of life, but what the Holy Spirit does is ensures us that we never have to lose hope. We can always cling to the joy and the peace that Christ died for us to have. So we can live our lives with the Holy Spirit that dwells in us to bring the fullness on earth, to bring glory to God. That's what we're to do. 
We're to bring glory to God and tell others about the love and the glory of God. And the Holy Spirit who's in us enables us to do that. Holy Spirit gives us power, gives us boldness, it gives us knowledge, and we have in us the, the power that put the Red Sea, the power that made the uh, walls of Jericho fall, the power that raised Lazarus from the dead, the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead to live forever is the same power that we have in us. So it's up to us. It's up to us to accept that, to acknowledge that, receive that positively, and then respond to the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your salvation, which is you have given us as a free gift of grace by faith in the Lord Jesus. Thank you also that the Holy Spirit has made us alive in him and placed us in the family of God and the body of Christ. Thank you that he, the Holy Spirit, has set his seal of ownership on us and taken up residence within us to empower us in our spiritual walk as he transforms us into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, if you've not yet received those, that if there's anybody here or anybody on Facebook, anybody who watch this later, it's watching later on YouTube. If you've not received Jesus as Savior, the Holy Spirit is right now prompting you to open the door of your life for the entrance of him who can forgive your sins and give you the gift of eternal life and the Holy Spirit. So I encourage you to open that door today. How do you do this? If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I encourage you to do that today. If you have not, do that today. Do it openly. Uh, uh, if you're by yourself, you know, do it now. And then let somebody know. Let somebody know. Tell somebody. If you're watching on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, in, the con in the comments, Say, I accepted Jesus as my Savior today so that we can rejoice with you. Now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 